Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Foreman community demo number 142. I'm Mark Glenn, and I'll be your host today. Um, so if you want to join either uh, live next time, um, you can watch for the link to this meeting at our matrix room, uh, the Foreman. Um, or you can also follow up in the same channel if you have any questions to what you will see today. Uh, you can find us there. So the agenda for today, we'll have quite a lot of topics in here. Um, we'll have eight demos, actually. Um, and we'll start with uh, some informations first, right? Um, the information is actually that Foreman 3.11 RC2 is out for a while now. So go ahead and please test that. And um, we expect to have a GA of 3.11 very soon, actually. So uh, I, I assume it may be actually in the next week. All right, and I guess we can start with the first demo, which is going to be performed by Carolina. It's going to be introduction to the new job invocation detail page. So Carolina, whenever you're ready. Uh, so hello. Um, I'd like to present to the new design of a job invocation detail page. Uh, this is just the design. Uh, I will also show you my progress. But first, why we are even uh, making a new page uh, for that. This is the old one. And as you can see, design is also not, uh, not the best. Uh, there are a few issues with the old page, so uh, we figured out it's just better to create a new one in React, so it's easier to fix any future bugs and the bugs that we currently have and uh, add new features there. Um, the new page is uh, redesigned so that uh, it's redesigned based on how customers uh, use it, so that it shows the most important information first. Um, this is currently my progress. Uh, there are going to be a lot of other things added in. I'm not going to go too deep into it. Uh, you, can, you can read more in this course that I will show you in a second. Uh, to be able to go to the new page, you just have to have the, the lab features setting uh, set on, and then you'll be able to go to the new UI from the old page. Um, the main differences here uh, is that we have an expandable a list of hosts uh, where we can find more information about it before it was uh, it was more difficult to open it you you would have to click on the name of the host and then see more information and also uh, also you will be able to select the hosts that you want to uh, that you want to uh, did you want to, uh, sorry, I got caught up in it. Um, yeah, that will, you will be able to rerun, abort or cancel or just open in a new tabs uh, because a lot of people apparently uh, like to open it in a new tab. And, uh, and yeah. That's basically that's basically it. Uh, we know that uh, some people could have different opinions about it, and maybe you can even come up with some new things that could be added in. Um, and if you have some questions or or some proposal. Uh, you can find a uh, discourse post uh, from Maria Spirik, our UX design designer, <laughs> and you can comment here. 
uh, I will be reading the chat and uh, hopefully responding to uh, the design is uh, not all up to me so uh, it will be nice to connect there or there is also a second post with new updates uh, we are we are currently also coming up with new updates like we deleted the environment column etc but maybe you will find it useful so you can you can comment that too and you can read uh, read about the page more here um, and and yeah I think that's all I wanted to say about it uh, I won't be describing every single detail, I think. Uh, but if anyone wants to add something, uh, feel free to feel free to say it now. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you very much for showing the current progress and for uh, showing also where people can share the feedback. Uh, that's very useful. Um, any questions here in the audience today? All right, I guess uh, no questions, so we can move to uh, to another demo. All right, so it's going to be yum metadata check some changes. Ian, over to you. Awesome, thanks, Mark. Just going to get my screen shared. Um, I'll run through my uh, my next demo after this as well, since I had two. Um, all right. Cool. So hey, folks. Uh, so what I'm going to be showing you all today, firstly, uh, are just some small changes to the setting you might see on the repositories edit page called <clears throat> Yum Metadata Checksum. It's likely that a lot of you have just been using the default Yum Metadata Checksum. Um, but for folks who are using it in the past, you might have noticed that there was a setting for SHA-1. Um, now, this checksum that we're talking about it, um, is just is only used for um, the published contents of your repositories. Um, so it's what Pulp will set up as the, uh, the checksum algorithm that is used for um, publishing the contents uh, of your YUM repositories. And we've removed SHA-1 because it's very unlikely that anyone will need that anymore, uh, even back to RHEL 6. There should be support for any of the more modern types that are actually secure. Um, I think we kept it in there for like RHEL 5 support, uh, which we really no longer need to worry about. Um, so SHA-1 is gone, and in developing this, that would have left only SHA-256, which would be kind of silly to have a drop-down, which is just default, or SHA-256. So we've also added in the new types that Pulp supports, which is 384 and 512. So if for some reason uh, you need to select your own specific checksum algorithm, you're able to do that now with three options. And I can't remember off the top of my head what the default is, um, but it's whatever it is set in pulp, and it would be within their documentation. That was just a small update there. Um, I'll just jump into my next demo, and then I can see if there are any questions on either of the topics, because both these things are short. Um, so this demo, this next bit, is about orphan cleanup. Um, Currently, uh, your system generates tons of pulp tasks. If you're syncing repositories, updating repositories, really doing anything that has anything to do with your actual content, pulp will be making lots of these tasks. Um, you'll also see lots of tasks in Foreman, um, and we have the ability for you to clean up these tasks. However, in pulp, um, 
we didn't have any exposed way for you to clean up these tasks besides running, actually, and it might even have been a new feature, running a pulp core manager job. Um, otherwise, you would have had to hit a pulp API yourself, um, which could be difficult to find out. So in my system, there are a number of completed tasks. And these tasks can really, uh, the count of them can get quite large. So anyway, we've added the ability now during Orphan Cleanup for these tasks to be purged. Um, there's also a new setting for how old these tasks should be before they get purged. Let me just go over to the settings, show you what the, let's see what this is. Let me go over to content. Let's see. So, whoops, completed pulp <clears throat> task protection days is the setting. And it's how many days before a completed pulp task is purged by Orphan Cleanup. So the, the default for here is 30. Um, so if I were to, say, set this to 1 and then run Orphan Cleanup, we would see that the task would get deleted. Um, I'm not going to do that right now because my, my Orphan Cleanup might take a bit. I haven't done it for a while. Um, but yeah, 30 is a decent default uh, in case you need to do any system debugging and you need to check back on when tasks were completed. I'll also add that we only are deleting completed tasks. Um, if you have any tasks that are in an errored state, um, if something failed, we will not delete them because those tasks are useful for debugging and you shouldn't have loads and loads of uh, aired out tasks. Um, However, if you are in that uh, category for some reason, um, you can call a uh, an API to actually purge those in pulp. Um, and I think you could do it via pulp uh, via pulp core manager. Um, I can't remember if you can select the the types that you want to delete with that. Um, but anyway, the pulp documentation has that information. But anyway, um, yeah, that's everything that I wanted to share. Um, did anyone have any questions? Uh, thanks, Ian. Uh, I'll start with mine. Uh, maybe that's something I've missed. But uh, does that mean there's a new tasks uh, new task that takes care of that? That if I go to monitor task, I would actually see a new type of task that takes care of this. Um, and is that automatically scheduled when I start the application, or how, how exactly does that, does that work? Yeah, exactly. There is indeed a new task, um, and it runs underneath our orf orphan uh, cleanup task. So um, it'll run as frequently as your orphan cleanup is. And for a reminder, um, the default cron job for that is uh, weekly. I think it's set on Sunday. Um, and if you want to change that, you can edit the Foreman uh, cron settings. Um, we are looking at some point to changing that to be a recurring logic, but that's a uh, another conversation. <laughs> OK, awesome. Thank you very much. And I believe Max Minan has a question. Max Minan, do you want to uh, ask it live? Uh, sure, thanks. Um, so do you know if DNF, so on? On registered hosts, if they can just consume this metadata, is there is it bound to any like DNF version, or do we know if it works on EL8 and EL9? That's a great question. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I have been playing around with the setting and just trying different checksum types when I merged this, um, and DNF was able just to consume them. I think I tested with an EL9 client, um, but yeah, it would be a good thing to test for. Uh, for EL8, for the uh, yeah these higher checksum algorithms. Mm, yeah, great. Because I I remember like long time ago there was a reference to EL5 uh, in the documentation regarding the uh, checksum uh, type or algorithm. Yeah, yeah. That and that's exactly why we had SHA1 in there for the longest time. It was just for rel rel5. <laughs> Okay, 
I'm happy that we could have finally got rid of that. Um, is there any other question for Ian? Seems like no more questions. So we will continue with the next demo about packages wizard on the new host index page. So Jeremy, whenever you're ready. Thanks, Mark. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Yes, and we can. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, OK, so I want to talk to you today about uh, an improvement we've made to the new host index page uh, around managing packages on your hosts. Um, so what we're looking at right now is what we had before. I just want to show you what we have currently so that you can see how big of an improvement this is. So. Uh, let's say I have some content hosts I want to manage my packages. What I would have to do here is this is the old content host page, which is going away eventually anyway. But I would have to select manage packages here. And then here is our current interface for managing packages on your hosts. Uh, you can see it's the, the design looks a little bit outdated. Um, and there are some disadvantages to this uh, user experience too. Like you have to know the package name. There's not even autocomplete. Um, and then you just choose your action here. So that's what it used to look like before. Um, but we have made some significant improvements with the new packages wizard on the new host index page. Um, oh, so just as a review, as you know, this new page is accessible via a setting. It's the uh, show new host overview page setting. So that's set to yes. Um, so when I go to all hosts, the new page is the page that I see here. So um, here's my new page with my, uh, I have a couple RHEL 9 hosts here. And I can select uh, one or more hosts and then uh, click this kebab menu here and manage packages. And here is our new Manage Packages wizard. Uh, so there's three flows to this wizard. I can um, upgrade all packages. I can upgrade a specific package. Or I can install packages. And uh, notice the, the wizard steps change depending on which, um, which item you have selected here. So let's say I want to upgrade a specific package. I select that and then I hit next. I'm presented with a list of packages here. Uh, this is the nice thing about Catello is uh, Catello knows every package that's installed on all of the hosts that we manage. Um, so this list here, you might notice there's only 210 results. Um, and that's because this is a list of only the upgradable packages on your hosts. And uh, you can select one or more packages here. Um, and you know, so we have uh, some UI niceties for if you forget to select one. Uh, you can also search with full autocomplete. Um, and uh, it just works sort of the way it's that, that you would think. Um, so once you have selected one or more packages, uh, it moves on to the review host screen. And uh, this is where you can review and optionally exclude hosts from your selection. Notice it does not say you can add hosts. So if I if I wanted to uh, add another host, um, like my CentOS 9, whatever that I have there, that does not show up in the search results. So I, I can take hosts away here by deselecting them, but I can't add one. So this is these are the two hosts that I'm going to perform this update on. And then finally, there's a review screen here where I we have this nice tree view. I can review what packages I selected to update. Uh, it shows me the number of packages here and then uh, the number of hosts I'm updating. Uh, if, uh, if this looks great, I can move on. If it doesn't, there are edit buttons here. If I click the edit button here, it just takes me back to the packages screen. If I, take, if I click the edit button here, it takes me back to the host screen. Uh, and then I can select either via remote execution or via customized remote execution. Uh, that's what I'm going to do now. So when I hit upgrade here, it's going to take me to the job wizard. We can see our uh, job template is pre-selected for us. It's filled in my target host and inputs. 
uh, I can see that this applies to those two hosts that I selected. And then my packages search query input is nice and human readable. It uses package names and not IDs. Um, and I can go ahead and execute that like any other remote execution job, or I can customize it further here since I'm on this uh, wizard here. So uh, that's the basic flow of the packages wizard. I think the only thing I haven't shown you yet is the install packages flow. Um, so it's very similar. The only difference here is instead of the 210 packages, I have over 5,000 packages here. Um, and so this is just a list of every package that Catello has access to. There's no way uh, that we could go through all of your hosts and see which packages are not installed on each host, because who knows how many hosts you have selected. That would take forever. So what I decided to do here is just this is a list distinct by name of every possible package. And you can search through that uh, select packages just like before. And uh, other than that, it's pretty much the same. And uh, that is the new packages wizard. I don't think this will make it into Catello 4.13, Foreman 3.11. So I, I think uh, 4.14 might be the version, which is in about three months. Uh, but if you are adventurous enough to install Nightly's, uh, please do and play around with this. We would love to get some more feedback on it. Um, it's always good to catch bugs. And I think that's it for me. Let's see if there's any questions. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. There is one question from Bernard. I yeah, have actually two questions. Uh, so first of all, pretty nice, uh, very cool. First uh, question is uh, about delete. Um, is it possible, will it be possible to, de to delete packages? And the second question is about, uh, well, something similar already exists if you are within a host um, and you um, somehow manage package. Would it make sense to adapt one, uh, this UI or the other UI to make it a uh, few similar? OK, so for the first question about remove it, Turns out the remove was not included in the design for this wizard. And I can't actually remember if that was, if there's a reason we decided not to include remove or if it was just an oversight. But um, I think remove is probably an essential thing we should add at some point as well. I could see it being added right here as a fourth uh, flow. And it would be pretty similar to the upgrade packages flow. Um, and then your second question was about reusing the UI from the host details page. Um, we actually decided not to do that because on host details, we, we know a lot more about the host. Um, for instance, we know we can say what version of each package is installed on each host, what it's upgradable to. Um, and when you have, you know, five or a hundred or a thousand hosts selected, there's, there's not really a, a good way to get all of that information together. So that was the reason why we have a different interface for uh, bulk packages, per se. And then I saw also a question about deb packages. No, this does not work with deb packages yet. Um, there were some tricky things I had to do with the, the, in the, the list of packages, which um, you're certainly welcome to take a stab at it. Thanks, Jeremy. I believe that there was uh, also a second question in, in the, the comment, which is, is there a skip to review button similar to how remote execution has uh, basically skipped into the last step? Oh, so right. Example, I, I yeah. did see that one. Um, no, there's not. Um, that was not built into the design. But one thing that you can do instead is if um, you, you can click on these wizard steps here and move around. And as long as we have everything we need for that particular step, the step will be enabled. Um, so like if I have a package selected here, then the review step becomes enabled and I can just go straight there. OK, nice. 
Uh, I don't see other questions, but I'll uh, I'll raise one. Well, not sure if that's a question. Maybe rather a feedback if you're uh, if you're uh, searching for that as well. I believe that in this screen we see the the selector with the remote execution and we have customized remote execution. And I think this came from the old page where we had either via catalog agent or via remote execution because we used to have two providers. I think right now uh, the more Meaningful text would be something like run immediately or uh, customize the run first or something like that. Um, so maybe that's just a wording thing, hopefully something small, but I, I, I would find it more explanatory. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, yeah, definitely that wording was just taken from all our previous pages. Didn't really think much about it, but it, that makes sense to me. Cool. Any more questions for Jeremy? Seems like like no more questions. So we're going to uh, move ahead. And we'll stay with Jeremy, actually, who will also show us uh, republishing of the repository or continuous version metadata. Well, that one's not me. Is that you, Samir? Oops. Uh, I think I've already demoed this in a previous one. I don't think it was on the agenda. But this one. OK, so it's not was... on the agenda. Yeah, sorry for that. So that must have been a mistake in my slides. Uh, so demo gods were not that friendly to me today. Sorry for that. Uh, so the next step is actually uh, editing the comment. Uh, Maria, please go ahead. Yeah, hello. We have the new um, host details page, and we're working on making it better slowly. And um, yeah, editing the comment seems like to be a request from people, and it was not too complicated to make. Um, so we added it fast. And we would like to add more things later, but they have a lot of dependencies, but the comment does not. So now you can go to your host detail. I'm assuming you can see my screen as well. Yes, we can. Great. So the host detail, you go to the overview tab, and you have the details card, you can just click on the pencil icon and edit the comment. And my Chrome is just slow. I have more info and just save it by clicking this button here. And it will be saved on your uh, post. Other than that, my second topic is um, small redesign to the job wizard. I think Jeremy was using a bit of a older version of the job wizard because now it uh, should be wider and easier to read. Uh, this change was mostly done so you can see the search query um, more widely and more clearly. I'm using a very small screen, which is why it's so squished together. But on normal screens, you should have plenty of space uh, to type in your search query and see what's in it and generally have more room in the job wizard. And those are my two topics. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Maria. Um, uh, I don't see any question right now. Is there any question live in the audience? I have just one comment. I really like the in-place editing on the host detail page. I'm looking forward to see more, more fields to be editable. I can imagine that the comment was relatively easy and others will be hard, but any contributions in this area, I think, would be very welcome. OK. Uh, and with that, uh, we'll jump to the next presentation, which is going to be provided by me. Uh, so I'm going to reshare the tab here. And I'm going to be talking about a uh, new default uh, hash function for the operating systems. So first, let me start with some context. Um, what are we actually talking about? So when you do the provisioning, uh, typically, you need to set the root password uh, as, as part of that process, uh, at least for the network-based provisioning. So for example, if we go to the Kickstart default template, uh, we'll see that, let, let's try to render that for some host. Maybe let's use the one that is currently using into a stream aid. 
we see there is this root password, but it's not sent in the plain text. It's rather cryptic, um, and that way it's stored uh, on the Linux. So when you know the root actually logs in, we take its plain text password, uh, apply the hash function on that, and if, if it matches this hash, and we know it, the password is right. Uh, now, there is a prefix here after the first dollar sign, which basically says which hash function was used uh, to get that hash, because there are multiple hash functions. Uh, some of them, though, are now considered weak, because uh, you, know, uh, you could easily generate a collision. Therefore, a, a different password would also fit, um, and you could log in if you know the target, target hash. So uh, this $5 actually indicates that uh, SHA-256 should be used. If we look at some other host that uh, was set to a different uh, algorithm, uh, I think this one will show $6 that uses uh, SHA-512. Now, how we actually know what the hash function should be used, this is defined by the operating system. So if we navigate to the operating systems, uh, and I open the CentOS stream A that I was showing. Here we see that the root password hash is set to a specific algorithm. Now, the change I'm going to show is very small. In fact, I just wanted to give you the, the background. Um, today, if you create an operating system, uh, or until now, the default one was always set to SHA and 256, which is considered insecure for, for some time. Um, so whenever you've created a new operating system, uh, which typically means a new version, even a minor version was uh, was sent uh, or was was released, you actually needed to remember you should change it from SHA-256 to SHA-512 or something else if you prefer that. But this is, I guess, the best recommendation right now. So you don't have to do that anymore because this is the default value. Now, what happens for the existing operating systems? It is not changed. So even after you upgrade to the Foreman version where this is the default, all the existing operating systems will have the same configuration. So what you would have to do is manually basically change that. Um, and next time when you would provision a host in this operating system, it would actually apply the new configuration. So it doesn't change anything you have right now. But whenever you create a new operating system, the default will be more secure hash function. Be aware, if you're cloning the operating system, uh, that that uses the old version, uh, it's it's the default value set in the form because it's basically cloning the setting of the previous version. So again, you have to manually set it. All right. Any questions? I guess it was kind of clear. So we can move to the last topic for today, which is going to be presented by Bernard. Bernard, we're going to be ready. Yeah, welcome. So let me share my screen. Good. So the origin of that new plugin, or well, it's not really new. Uh, it was a nice uh, presentation at Config Management Camp, um, and we talked about. Um, CVE handling. And to understand what the purpose of that plugin is, um, I need to present that slide. Well, it is um, most of the operating system packages are delivered by Catello, as we all know. But there are some application software which is maybe not handled by Catello, like software you install by tar archive um, by some RPM packages, um, by Git cloning, by Docker containers, whatever. And if you have these applications installed um, on your host, maybe you don't get errata for them. Um, and if you don't get errata, you're not aware if there are security holes in uh, these uh, packages. And therefore, um, I presented at the config management camp one possibility to scan that um, additional software you deliver to your host um, with vulnerability scanners like um, Trivi and Gripe. And they can, um, well, search for CVEs in the Docker containers in a file system locations, etc. And then someone um, 
well said. Well, that's maybe a, a good thing for a plugin and um, have a look at this uh, config reports, uh, which can maybe store these um, these uh, results from uh, the Trivi scanner or for the gripe scanner. And so I created that um, plugin during the journey back from um, from the config management camp. So you can already have a look at it. And actually it delivers uh, not very much. It's it's not complete right now. It's maybe like a draft um, or proof of concept. So it delivers actually two different um, or three different jobs. Install this, the security scanner, run the security scanner and run the security scanner and write facts. Um, so the installation is pretty straightforward. It just uh, install with yum. So no support for other operating system than uh, rel based. And it installs the URL from Trivia and from Gripe um, on your target system. Then there's another job template which um, which uh, does the does a scan. So it first of all tries to find out do we want to scan with Trivi or do we want to scan the host with Scribe? Is it is it a scan for a Docker image or for a file system location? And then it will actually um, scan the host and write the the findings, the JSON uh, output um, to your Rex job. So uh, that is here. So that is um, one run um, and it um, called the the host to run on this or the Rex to run on this host. It rendered, um, please use Trivi um, and uh, search CVEs on our image, on a Docker image with that name. Scan only for vulnerabilities, be quiet. And the format, the output format is JSON. Um, so that will result in something like this. Very huge output. Um, and this will contain all vulnerabilities um, of that particular Docker image. And then someone said, well, that's nice, but it's not readable. Um, can you extend um, it and write a config report? So all found CVEs are written um, as a config report. So it will run the Rex job and the output will be analyzed. Um, and as it is JSON, you can pass all the output and then create a config report for it. And for example, here it writes, okay, we have um, pretty bad CVE, Apache 2 SSL. Um, there's a CVE for it, uh, HTTPT, uh, and a link to, uh, to that uh, CVE, for example, here, it's a list. Of, not too bad. A lot of warnings, some debug, some info, but maybe you should update um, that Docker image and use a different one. Um, yeah, so that is the idea. And well, the, 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 the biggest uh, challenge was to parse the output from Rex. And there's also discussion here in the community forum um, because there was a work from someone um, in Foreman to have that as a base functionality. Um, so that would be an idea, um, which then can be used for, for plugins like the Foreman CV scanner. Okay, so any questions? I don't see any questions right now, but I would like to ask, so, well, First of all, that's very beautiful functionality. Uh, and it connects the foreman world with containers as well, which is always interesting. Um, my question is, uh, you've you've shown us basically working uh, version. So I wonder, what is the plan for future? If there's anything that you'd like to add? Um, and where you, where is the place that you would be expecting the feedback? 
So uh, actually, the, the first and most important thing is it need to be uh, um, OS independent, of course. Then I think uh, um, another one would be, well, if you currently have a look at the config reports, it doesn't show an icon. Um, and you actually has too many things left here. And well, uh, config report is a nice idea to store that information, but I think it makes sense to create something like a user interface, which um, can then show all the CVE data. Um, that would be one one major thing someone need to do, or I need to do. Um, and um, well, the thing you brought up in the uh, in the discussion, the community discussion, that that feature for form and remote execution to to actually parse stuff, which you re, will be returned from a Rex job, that is something like a base functionality, which maybe can be used for various different other plugins too. Um, currently, that's done with a pretty. It's not a hack. It's a workaround. It's a Rails functionality, but it can be, of course, improved. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, Max Milan has a question. Yeah. Um, have you considered, maybe it's more of a question and suggestion. So the exit code of the remote execution job, if I saw that correctly, it was one because the scanner found something. Mm -hmm. But my first impression was if the scan runs successfully, it should be zero. So your remote execution job should report. Of course. Yeah. All, all good. <laughs> But I think, yeah, the default from Trivia and Cripe is if it finds something, then it's bad <laughs> and it exits one. Yeah, the expectation is, of course, if you run that Rex job and it doesn't find, um, it should uh, return success. And if there is a CDE found, then um, please, it's an error code. All right, thank you. And Ian is next with his question. Yeah, so I just kind of had a follow up to when we were talking about parsing data out of the uh, Rex jobs. Um, was there any thinking about kind of integrating this feature with the errata tracking that we already have? It might be slightly interesting to be able to, I don't know, see if there's a CVE detected compare it against the errata that we believe are mm -hmm. present on a host and you know do some kind of comparison there that's uh you know if something was off it would be very interesting for an admin i mean you know the amount that we gain there i guess might be a bit small compared to you know stuff tracking things that catello can't already do um but it might be a little interesting at least to pair up the cves with the errata information we already have in our database yeah, sure. So, well, actually, if there is errata data, then uh, you can. It would be possible to compare it with the uh, the findings from the CVE scanner. Uh, but actually, if there is, for example, a completely new CVE, and maybe there is not yet um, errata available, or it's a software component which is not installed by Catello, then you would never see CVE and never see errata on your system. But of course, it, for, these, for these packages where um, they are delivered by Catello and you also do a CVE scan, um, you can compare it and see, um, is my host really secure? Yeah, I think this could definitely give admins, I don't know, more sense of feeling. security. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. I don't see any more questions. So thank you, uh, Bernard. That was a really nice presentation. Um, and it's going to be time to wrap up. Um, so if anyone watching this has any question, as I mentioned in the beginning, please go to the matrix, uh, the foreman room, and ask there. We'll be able to, uh, to get uh, the presenter to respond. Um, and if everything goes according to the plan, the next community demo should be on July 11th. If you would like to join, uh, watch the matrix room for the link so that you can join and ask questions live. Um, and yeah, thanks to all presenters today. 
was fun. So thank you.